Yeah. Otherwise, I forget. Yeah. Okay. I'll close, I'll close the door. So, hello. Um, we already, I think we've discussed many articles, but, um, and we always kind of forgot this one. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the article about the only new um, uh, treatment we will, um, that has been trialed in 2020. So, I think it's time to discuss it now. So, it's Ofatumumab against teriflunamide in uh, people with MS. And so, as we all know, ofatumumab is also a CD20 monoclonal antibody. Um, so, uh, as opposed to oculizumab, so the, uh, the CD20 we already have, this is fully humanized. It's administered subcutaneously. Um, it binds to the smaller and larger loop of CD20. Um, and this is different from the epitope that is targeted by, the, by oculizumab. Um, it's whenever it binds to a B cell, um, the lysis of the cell is more um, coordinated by complement dependent lysis rather than antibody dependent lysis. And this is different from oculizumab too. Uh, and it would lead to faster B cell repletion, but also faster reconstitution of the um, uh, cellular and humoral immune system. And so you give it 20 milligrams subcutaneously every four weeks after a loading dose on day one, seven and 14. And so I found this table, which in my uh, opinion, perfectly summarizes all the relevant differences uh, between ofatumab. And um, I personally think that these differences will be much more important in determining whether ofatumab will be or um, will yeah, kind of um, replace oculizumab or whether it will um, um, be suppressed by oculizumab in summary. So I personally think that the fact that it's uh, subcutaneously and that people can do it themselves. They were even allowed in the trial. They had like this little teacher uh, teaching session and they could even administer these, uh, all these in injections subcutaneously at home. So I guess this is like a huge, huge advantage that also reduces the logistic burden of the drug. And yeah, I personally think that uh, many national insurances around the world um, will see it similarly, will focus on this kind of these kind of logistic benefits and will prioritize ofatumumab over oculizumab. But then, um, so I don't know if you, if anybody thinks it's relevant um, or whether the difference um, in epitope is relevant between both of them, I don't know. Um, so apparently oculizumab binds to um, one region of CD20. And then, so ofatumumab binds to the large and the small loop of the CD20 um, um, epitope. Um, and um, so this antibody dependent um, lysis versus the complement dependent lysis, I don't, I guess this depends maybe the aggressiveness of the lysis. I don't know or in to how we should interpret this difference, how relevant it is. Um, and then, um, so the definitely also very good thing is that um, ofatumumab is only associated with injection site reactions and not with the relatively, I mean, with the very, very common infusion reactions that we see with uh, oculizumab. And so, um, yeah, the, the infusion or the injection itself is much better tolerated. Um, and it's also just quicker. You see three and a half hours, 10 minutes, you know, so yeah, and at home, and you can do it yourself. So regardless of all the biological reflections we're gonna make in the rest of the presentation, I do think that these logistical benefits are gonna be very determinant in how this, yeah, in whether this drug will, will how popular this drug is gonna be. But Gavin, do you think that this different epitope and this different, yeah, um, mode of action for the cell lysis is biologically and potentially mechanistically, yeah, is it relevant? No, I, I, I don't think so because, you know, going to uh, the oncology indication, you know, all these drugs work in B cell lymphomas. Oculizumab was never taken forward because they took, they took a more potent one forward, Roche, Gazizer, whatever it's called, which is even more potent than these three in terms of uh, deep tissue de depletion, but they all, um, deplete to, to the similar degree. Now, I mean, I know that you mentioned either that repopulation kinetics of opatumumab is better than with oculizumab and rituximab. Yeah, yeah, but that's not but, necessarily an advantage. I know, I know. Well, no, the, but that, those studies were done after very few courses. You know, they were done in the mm. first six months. Uh, and so, of you know, we don't know. I mean, we know that with rituximab, 
you know, we, you know, when you just give one or two doses, you you repopulate very quickly. Mm -hmm. And when you when you've been on the drug for four or five years, you'll repopulate mm -hmm. much more slowly. So I suspect the same will happen with alpha-tumumab. You know, once you've been on the drug for many yeah. many months or years, the repopulation kinetics are not, are not going to be too dissimilar to ocarizumab or rituximab, but simply because you you know every time you every time you inject yourself, you're going to get more and more deep tissue, um, lymph, you know, bone marrow and secondary lymphoid organ depletion. So this idea of they think the drug's reversible in inverted commas is not necessarily correct. You know? But uh, so I was going to touch on it a little bit later, but what I read is that, re that we, so I couldn't actually find a study that exactly analyzes the re repopulation kinetics with ofatumumab on this dose. But they did a study, I guess it was as a part of their phase two exploratory studies, in which it trialed similar, but not exactly the same dose. And then it took 40 weeks for B cells to repopulate to the lower limit of normal. But in ocrelizumab, it's 72 weeks. Yeah, so they they um, they've got modeling data which I've seen presented. I don't yeah. think they published it, showing you the repopulation yeah, kinetics. Yeah. Which, in other words, you would start see, seeing uh, seeing repopulation within within eight weeks with alpha tumor map. Even if you miss the next injection, you'll start uh, seeing the B cells weeks. coming back. That's what they claim, uh, and they yeah. are repeat they are repeating it with the licensed dose as well. So there will be more data coming out. Ah, you know. oh, yeah, okay. Because what I saw was forty weeks, mm, so it's actually much quicker. Well, for one four four zero for what for repopulation kinetics uh well, after, after yes no it's quicker than that because i found this in this neurology article so it's the one that's um so but the problem is obviously they didn't exactly use um the dose that was trialed it was no no so the the, the the rapid repopulation kinetics reversing within two to three months or at least getting b cells uh, um uh, in the peripheral blood is with the 20 milligram uh, monthly dose. This dose. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, you know, I want you to I want you to understand that subcutaneous is not always an advantage because there is a perverse incentive, even mm -hmm. within the NHS. There's a perverse incentive for making money out of infusions. Um, so, Biogen just get, and the reason why I know about this, Biogen developed the subcutaneous natalizumab yeah. ten years ten years ago. And they were about to launch it. Uh, it was completely bioequivalent in terms of the IV formulation. But the sales team in the United States yeah. um, made them not launch it because they said that one of the reasons why American neurologists like prescribing nalizumab is because they can charge and make money out of infusions. Yeah, you know but that's I mean? the thing. That's what I thought. Because in Belgium, it's the same. Because if people have to be... Yeah, obviously, Belgium or ca my capitalist home country <laughs> applies the same kind of market principles uh, in, when it comes to healthcare. And so it's indeed true that when you can, but it's not specifically the neurologist, but it's mainly the hospital itself, because it, this is like day, day hospitalization units or daycare units. But um, indeed, they charge incredible sums of money for people to be there this for this three and a half hour infusion, etc. So, but... Yeah, in my ideal world, it's an advantage because people can do it at home and you save so much money. Yeah, I agree with you completely. You know, when we, so the, so even with the, with the, even with the NHS, we as a MS service, yeah, you know, we get reimbursed. We don't make a lot of money out of it. We get we do make money in terms of a trust um, by giving infusions of oh, really? PMGs. Yeah, I, I mean it's a small payment. They cut in the past. There used to be yeah. quite a big reimbursement. They've reduced it now quite substantially. So the, the amount of money we make from infusions is, to be honest with you, not worth the effort because you could redeploy or use those nursing staff in other things. Yeah. So yeah, my, yeah. Personal, my personal opinion, the incentives within the NHS uh, are probably not there anymore for mm -hmm. uh, making money out of giving infusions. But definitely in private healthcare markets, um, you know, so this is why I think Ophitumumab will do well relative to Oculusumab in the UK because oh. of the NHS. But outside the UK and the United States, I've got a feeling um, oculizumab will still be the dominant uh, drug simply because uh, infusions are, you know, I think for every infusion, uh, uh, MA service charges make several thousand but dollars. I thought potentially there is also more like a subjective component to this because I have the feeling that people might potentially feel better treated if they get an infusion rather than a sort of injection. <laughs> Don't you think? Because I think it sounds more potent to have an infusion. 
Well, I mean, my personal opinion, it's it's um, my personal opinion, it should be patient choice. But I can see us being able to start people on Ofatumumab once it's licensed and available. You know, literally within uh, much quicker. You know, at the moment there there's a waiting list for Kaluzumab. Mm. Um, is there still a waiting list since I've been off sick? Is there still a waiting list, Kimberly, for Kaluzumab? Um, um, not that I'm aware of. But yeah, well, I think there are always waiting lists. But Nobody think, is going on these drugs immediately. I think it's probably influenced now by the vaccine readiness. Um, and I don't want to jump the gun, but I just wanted to ask, do you think that the repopulation kinetics are favourable for ofatumumab versus ocrelizumab in terms of... But we are going to come on back to this later because I have many present part slides okay. on this. Because right. let's, let's wait, because otherwise well, it's a bit stupid to discuss everything based on this one slide. Okay, let's move on then. Yep. Okay, um, so... And it's um, so obviously they would never want to compare it exactly against interferon beta because then it would be too clear how this drug behaves, <laughs> behaves compared to oculismab. So they chose teriflunamide um, as a comparat active comparator in the trial. And we all know this drug because it's adverse effect prone. <laughs> so and nobody likes to take it. <laughs> so anyway, anyway. Um, so the eligibility criteria. So um, people between 18 and 55 years old. Um, so um, so this was actually the first time that I specifically saw that also, so normally they just put, you have one relapse in the preceding year or two relapses in the preceding two year, but, and you have relapsing remitting MS, but now it was specifically mentioned, I think in my limited knowledge for the first time, that also people with secondary progressive MS um, could be included as long as they had secondary relapsing MS or secondary MRI active MS. Um, so, and then uh, obviously all people with previous DMTs and previous um, um, B cell depleters were excluded. Um, so uh, this was um, as expected, a randomized double blind, double dummy, active controlled multi-center trial. Um, and so as now has become the habit, they did two uh, phase three times in parallel, um, just to avoid any discu discussion on the results. Um, as in all the other trials, the analyzed relapse rate was the primary outcome. And then, um, so the secondary outcomes were disability related, um, MRI related, um, and also incorporating brain volume loss. And then, um, which has also become now a new, uh, a new uh, habit in these trials to include neurofilaments, but serum neurofilaments. Um, so these are, this is the table that summarizes the um, demographics. Um, so there is not much special about this. So they included uh, eight, 1,882 patients in total. Uh, people stayed 1.6 year median in the trial. Um, and so then, uh, so you see the Asclepius 1 trial, Asclepius 2 trial, and then they had approximately uh, between 450 and 500 people in each arm. Um, but these were the majority of these people you see were on interferon beta or glatramir acetate, but not many of them had used something else. And so I guess this is some sort of error they, with the data because no B cell therapy was theoretically allowed. Um, like this. Um, and then, so these are the key results. So um, the primary endpoints uh, was the analyzed, uh, adjusted analyzed relapse rate. And then we see that ofatumumab reduces relapses with approximately 50% uh, um, compared to teriflunamide. And so the um, rate ratio is 0 0.49. This is a little bit less than what uh, ocrelizumab did compared to interferon beta. Um, so in for interferon beta was 0 0.55 or 54, I think. Um, I don't know whether it's relevant, but yeah, it re yeah for uh, ocrelizumab, both, both arms were, were re the re relapse rate was reduced with 55%. Um, so, and then, um, so they looked at disability worsening, uh, confirmed at three months, and then disability worsening confirmed in six months. So I've put here the definitions of the dif disability work, uh, worsening. So as all, yeah, as it's, um, yeah, very often. Uh, so it means that people need to increase with 1.5 point, 
points on the EDSS if the score was zero, one point if the score was one between one and five before, and then 1.0.5 points if the EDSS baseline score was more over 5.5. And then um, for six months confirmed disability, they used a slightly different definition. So the disability improvement criteria were um, yeah, so this is for the improvement. They had to be, they had to have a reduction of one point uh, with low EDSS and a reduction with 0 0.5 points with high EDSS. Um, so, and then um, compared to teriflunamide, mm -hmm, um, Ofatumab reduced the disability worsening in the first three months with 65, 66%. Uh, at six months, it was 68%, but um, it, we were never able so they weren't able to show a significant improvement in disability, so it was not significant. And then um, when it comes to the MRI-related outcomes, so there is a, this S has been shown in many other studies, a very uh, pronounced and very um, um, complete effect on um, MRI endpoints, such as gadolinium-enhancing lesions and T2 lesions. So you see here, the number of lesions per scan with ofatumab is 0 0.01 and 0 0.02 um, on um, when it comes to gadolinium enhancing lesions and the difference. Um, so this is much less than what you see, obviously, um, with teriflunamide. And then, um, but both low, low numbers. And then for the T2, uh, it's 0 0.72, 0 0.64 compared to four lesions in teriflunamide. So, yeah, the, the effects on the MRI param parameters are, yeah, are very, uh, very strong. Um, and then obviously what we all want to know is whether um, there are also differences in brain volume change. And again, so similar to oculizumab um, compared to interferon beta, they could not um, see a significant effect on brain volume change. Um, and so, uh, although there was an effect on serum neurofilament, so here, um, so this is also a secondary outpoint, point, but they looked at what extent of Atumumab reduced serum, serum neurofilament in people with MS compared to uh, teriflunamide. And at all three um, time points, so three months, 12 months, and 24 months, there was a significant reduction, um, uh, significant more pronounced reduction of serum neurofilament with of Atumumab compared to um, teriflunamide. Um, so these are um, the plots or the graphs that visualize these, um, these outcomes. So the disability worsening, the disability at three months, six months, and then disability improvement. Here, this is not significant. Uh, and then the first two plots show a significant difference. Um, and then um, the adverse events. Um, so um, during the, so yeah, obviously they find, always find a lot of adverse events because everything is counted. But what matters are obviously the serious adverse adverse events, um, and then you see that uh, only ten percent, only only uh, that ten percent of people present with the um, serious adverse events, while there is also eight percent in teriflunamide, and then eight percent in the second Asclepius two versus also a little bit less in the teriflunamide trial. Um, so, um, but in terms of infections or adverse events, nothing, they saw a slight increase in what they always see, um, nasal, like um, uh, um, nasal congestion, um, um, like colds, that kind of more um, common infections, but no, no very, no severe infections. Uh, I think they also didn't see a herpes sing signal, if I recall correctly. Um, and then, um, so what's also obviously very interesting is that they that they only have injection-related uh, systemic reactions, but these are much less common than what we see in oculizumab. In oculizumab, it's around 30%. So this is here 16%, so and 24 while uh, so it's clearly a better tolerated when you get it um, than oculizumab. And then, so this is again um, the visualization of the brain volume loss data. Um, so uh, yeah, it's very clear that there is no difference between teriflunamide and ofatumumab. Um, and then here I've put the visualization of the neurofilament data. Um, so you see here, so that um, um, that's uh, it's so the difference between both arms is seven percent at month three, 27 percent at month 12, and 23 percent at month 24. Um, so and um, so these are 
23%, that's one fifth less. Um, so I, I, it's, it's a relatively big difference in serum neurofilament, but it doesn't translate into a significant difference in brain volume. Um, so probably bigger reductions are needed um, to affect at least on the short notice that this trial is conducted um, on brain volume. And then, um, so which was interesting, so this is the, their um, graphs on B cell depletion. So they say that by week two, 95% uh, of the people had B cell um, depletion um, or had um, B cells depleted, so um, which, which is the mode of action of the drug. Um, and so this was also, I think they also did a, a new analysis in which they um, um, divided these people uh, according to BMI. And I think in this, in with Ofatumab, there was no difference in B cell depletion according to BMI quartiles. Um, and so what I had, um, so this is the second, so this is, yes, here, this is with the weight quartiles, but they did body weight 41 to 60 kilo. And then um, this is the first quartile. And then the fourth quartile was 84 to 172. And so with the current dosage, there is no difference in um, B cell depletion rates, rates. And then obviously, so they don't include data on repopulation, but it's what I also included in our, uh, in the Veloci comments. And this was based on the study that was published in neurology. So the study from Bar or in 2018, where they modeled different doses and based on that modeling study. Um, so um, it looks like the repopulation of B cells in um, with Ovatumab took 40 weeks, but maybe there is newer data that's kind of um, that are, are more precise and just test and or newer modeling strategies that just test this dose. Um, but, and then, um, so one of the things that I also find very remarkable, but I don't know if I'm interpreting everything right, but it looks like Ofatumab is not giving the um, severe IgM um, depletion so quickly then um, um, in comparison with Ocrelizma because these are the data that I got from um, that I got over uh, when it, uh, regarding uh, Ocrelizumab. And at the end of the Ocrelizumab phase three trial, you see here at week 96, you see that approximately 20% 20, 20 of people as, is, is below the lower limit of normal of IgM. And indeed only 2% of people for IgG. But when you look at the data for Ofatumumab, it looks like at week 120 or uh, week 96, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so that for IgM, that at least not 30% of the people is, 20% of the people is below the lower, lower limit of normal. And um, for IgG, it looks like nobody is below this lower limit of normal. So, yeah, it looks like, I don't know what it would mean, I assume, but um, it's just entering the lymph nodes less than. Um, I, I don't know how you have to interpret it. I don't know if it is a correct deduction that I make, but it looks at least from what the, the graphs or the data that I have at my, um, that I can access, that Ofatumab is leading to less IgM depletion and less IgG depletion. Um, so the question is Ocrelizumab or Ofatumumab? <laughs> That's a summary. I don't know the answer. I think there are many different good answers. Um, I guess in terms of short-term efficacy, um, I don't see many difference, but it's, it's about the long-term. And um, yeah, I, it's not entirely clear. So about the long-term, I think if the B cells repopulate faster, I think it could have advantages in terms of vaccine readiness. So, which is obviously during this specific time in our life, maybe important, but um, um, and makes it more, it makes it more easy to switching and, and switching to different drugs. So it's convenient maybe, but um, yeah, I just, I think if this is true, I don't know if this is a benefit, but it would definitely mean that you could use it more long-term. If it's true, then I think it's better to use it long-term than Ocrelizumab, because in this sort of analysis of the um, of the um, IgG data, I thought there was a link between IgG depletion and severe infection. So yeah, if we can avoid that, 
But on the other hand, we also know then from the more uh, spin-off data of oculizumab that um, you need high doses and that, um, that people that had higher exposure to oculizumab had um, more changes, um, more, more reductions in brain volume loss. So yeah, the question is if this would reflect soft B cell depletion in a way, um, whether um, there is any, any future in this drug to, um, to avoid brain volume loss in the long term. But yeah, it's not, I don't have an answer. So <laughs> it's just reflections. No, no. So I, I think the RGG, RGM, um, were the cutoffs the same in terms of defining the limits of normal or were they different? Do so, you know? Between, yeah. Between, between the two, the actual Here. cutoffs. So let me see if it's maybe. I think the bottom line is, is that anti CD20 therapy is much more likely to cause IgM drops in IgM and IgA early on. Mm -hmm. And the IgG takes much longer than two years to emerge because of the mm -hmm. half life and the fact that plasma cells are unaffected by this agent. So you only start seeing the uh, drop in IgG start really start to emerge, you know, uh, in year four, five, six, and beyond. So um, I think uh, you know, in trying to interpret what happens with IgG of it of, of two years is just too early. You know? mm. No, but it was just because it was so pronounced in in or opera because yeah, twenty percent. You know, that's a lot of people already at week ninety six. And then I just looked at this graph, and there was yeah, it was definitely more optimistic when it comes to um, IgM depletion. Yeah, for over two up. Yeah, so but, I think I, th I think we need to just make sure. Um, and I can't remember if those cutoffs are the same as, you know. Oh, yeah, okay. the, reason, the reason why I say this is because the companies yeah, yeah, use, yeah. A central, use a central lab and, and often the central laboratories that they use, believe it or not, have different normal ranges for various, <laughs> various analyses. And so you may find oh, yeah. that the, the, uh, um, the, the normal ranges may differ between the two laboratories. But if it would be true, what would it mean for you? I think they're going to be the same in terms of the risk of IgG deficiency with time, mm -hmm. uh, based on the mode of action. You know, why wouldn't you uh, become IgG deficient with lo you know uh, with long term? Yeah. Um, that's that's what I, that's. Yeah, but maybe it's lower, or maybe it's less. Um, but if, yeah, based on but maybe because if your IgG and IgM, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. So I think I, I, so I think I think I think, that's, I think based that's cool. on the B cell depletion, it should be the same. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's also what they. I think what um, uh, what Novartis and Ofatumumab mm -hmm. are trying to say is that they are not in, they're not as potently depleting the deep tissue, peripheral lymph nodes, and bone marrow as much or as extensively as ocrelizumab. So you're right. They're talking about a, a much lighter level of con continuous B cell depletion. And that may prove to be correct, and it may prove to be safer in terms of both the uh, risk of hypergammaglobulinemia, also yeah. the risk of serious adverse infections, and also vaccine readiness. I don't know if you're aware, but um, there's Novartis is doing an enormous vaccine trial. I'm li I, you know, literally with 2,000 subjects to see oh, really? how the yeah, to see what the vaccine responses are. So I think if the vaccine responses are preserved or better on for tumor map yeah, yeah you know that's going to be a big advantage um you know in terms of the safety of the product yeah of course of course so ben you got ms would you want to be on offer tumor map or cruzumab ben he's not listening. sorry we've been dealing with some uh cannula issues on the ward i, I missed a lot of that offer to me or cruzumab uh, I think especially now, I'd prefer to self-inject at home and avoid coming into hospital. I think that's quite a big advantage. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, in terms of the repopulation kinetics, do we think that's just a bioavailability thing? Or do we think that's a biological, a real, a real effect? Um, well, I think it's a real effect. It's based on... Yeah, the problem is we don't really know exactly what the repopulation kinetics are for this particular dose they've tested in the trial. They modeled it based on the previous uh, trial that um, that uh, GSK did. Because G I don't know if you're aware, but GSK developed the compound and then mm. uh, licensed it to Novartis. So the GSK oh. is still going to make money out of this out of this product. But uh, so is that so? Why does it because? Um... 
is it maybe because the half life is shorter, or why is it exactly? That's well, that's what I mean. Do we, yeah. do we know if it's subcut? Do we know what the the drug kinetics are? I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Does it follow the drug kinetics, or is there something different? Yeah. Presumably, it's much longer lived and lower do lower peak dose in plasma, right? For the subcut. That's my my basic understanding of pharmacokinetics. Yeah, I mean, and there are some theoretical reasons because when you give it subcut, it goes via lymph nodes into the peripheral mm. circulation. Mm. So um, they say a lot. Of, they say a significant chunk of the product doesn't go via the bloodstream. It goes via. I don't know if you know, but interstitial fluid drains into lymph nodes more than it does into veins, and so mm. the, um, there's there is this argument that it's it's depleting uh, at least some of the deep lymph, lymph tissue as it as it gets into the peripheral circulation. That's interesting. Um, I mean, it's also a testable hypothesis, right? You can do those, you, we could uh, yeah, redo yeah. those nice experiments where they do painful beta repertoire in cervical nodes and CSF and blood. Yeah, I think, that is do I think that is doable. I mean, you could actually ask the question, um, you know, in terms of its depletion kinetics, is it having a different impact on uh, deep lymph nodes versus peripheral blood or bone marrow i think i think i think that's that's a question that we need to answer is is there a difference in to, in the pattern of b cell depletion with opatumumab saying that though uh, roche is developing a subcutaneous formulation of ocrelizumab mm -hmm. <laughs> need, need a head to head which we know will mm -hmm. never happen mm -hmm. can i ask a, a slightly uh, unrelated question um can anyone give me a good explanation of why, what's the benefit of doing these two parallel identical trials? It but seems like a waste of money to me. No, it's, it's what, because now they have to repeat the oratoria too, eh? because there is doubt. They can't, they, I think they have, this has been raised in the past. It's just to be 100% sure about the results. So if something is significant that you can replicate it. Yes, yeah, so it's, to, it's to avoid a type, a type one error. A type one error is a false positive. So type two is a false negative. So it's basically to, is to um, make sure that you're not getting a false positive result. That's, uh, that's the, that's, the regulators ask for it, Ben. I completely agree with you. When you see the power of these two trials, you know, um, and they're replicating each other almost identical, it's a regulatory requirement that you have to do two trials, if the European Medicine Agency and the FDA. To be honest with you, they don't have to be identical. I mean, um, there have been drugs licensed on studies that aren't identical, but you know, doing but these it's two true identical. That actually, it would be a better, um, so if you could choose, it would be maybe better to do something like alumtuzumab with the KRMS1 and the KRMS2 and to have like the early, early MS and more advanced, medium advanced MS. And so then at least if you can, then you have two populations and yeah, the, a different profile of people in, in the trials. Yeah, because if, yes. if there is type one error from systematic biases, then if you've got identical designs like this, you're just going to reproduce that. That's a very good argument. I, com I completely agree. And I, and I think it has made a very good point. The the data set you get from the KMS1 and KMS2, the Alentuzumab trials, is much more valuable. But you, know, you, have think, your, you have your yeah. naives in one mm -hmm. population and mm -hmm. you have your second lines in another population. You know? yeah. But I do think, Ben, if you're looking for small differences, it can be relevant. And they already knew that, for example, the brain volume, it was going to be small differences. So I guess if, because obviously that would be the holy grail eh, to find uh, a CD20 that has effect on, on brain volume. So obviously for, for, I think for the relapse rate, it would not have been necessary, but if you would find something for brain volume and it would be positive, it would be forever like, is it? Um, but I don't know if that justifies the identical design, eh? but I, I, it's at least um, just, I think for those secondary outcomes, it's probably more relevant to have a parallel trial than for the primary. Uh, yeah, I get your point. But if we care that much about those secondary outcomes, we should be powering the trials to detect them in the first place, yeah, yeah, not relying yeah, 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 on Because yeah, yeah. yeah. this just seems another yeah. huge barrier in the way of investigator-led trials, right? I mean, if you need two big RCTs to prove mm. your point. This takes it even further away from normal academics. Yeah. Everything is going to Yeah, happen. it's true. It's true. I mean, and yeah, you know, these two trials. Uh, I wouldn't. Be, I wouldn't be surprised if these two trials cost. You know, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each, three hundred thousand dollars. This is the kind of. This is the kind of ballpark of the cost of these mm. trials. So it's an enormous expense. You know, big business. Enormous. Yeah. 
no, it is deep I, business because these drugs sell billions of dollars a year. So, you know, the investment mm -hmm. up front is enormous. You know, but, mm -hmm. uh, but so what do you think of this effect on, on brain volume? Because yeah, again, yeah, this is, so this is the, this to me is the real surprise. You know, so clearly there's more pseudoatrophy with ofatumumab in the year in the year one, and then they go mm -hmm. parallel. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, will the you know? Um, so uh, this is why I don't think MS is inflammation. Mm -hmm. I don't think MS is relapses in MRI activity. I think there's a you know there's something else happening in the tissue, in the brain beyond relapses in MRI, and this is what it is. Teriflutamide is probably doing something different um, uh, than just because this this is quite unexpected with teriflutamide. You would have expected it to be a significant difference in year two, you know, because there is a lag with brain volume loss. So this is surprising, really surprising. But it's the same. It replicates what we had with ocrelizumab, no? No, ocrelizumab had a positive effect of interference um, on brain volume loss. Um, so there was a positive study with interferons don't really affect brain volume loss. Not the teriflunamide clearly but has an in, I'll, I'll, uh, something else going on with teriflunamide. So ocrelizumab had a positive effect on brain volume loss in the phase three trial. Relative to interferon, yes, yeah, but that's because of interferon. Because it, so yeah, this, yeah, because this, interferon so, doesn't so, so what I'm trying to say is there's something there's something yeah there's a difference between the effect of teriflunamide yeah uh, and interferon on brain volume loss. No, it's not on your film. Ah, level. yes, it was in one of the two, only in one of the two. Yes, yes, yes. It was in the Opera One, but not the Opera Two. No, the effect. On, so it was also not universal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The teriflunamide in this trial was quite potent, still, right? And and Gavin, I guess in, in response to your point, played devil's advocate. It was quite a good anti, or well, anti relapse drug, wasn't it? Because the the analyzed relapse rate was 0 0.2 with the teriflunamide group, which is. Yeah, so I mean, I actually, I actually think the, I actually think this trial, in, in mm. my interpretation, uh, teriflunamide's done a lot better than people expected to do in this yeah. trial. Mm. Oh, so I mean, that, that's a good response, isn't it? That's... Yep. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 what I would like to do in the future is to use ofatumumab or, te, or ocrelizumab for two years, and then to put people on teriflunamide after that. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if um, um, B cell depletion followed by teriflunamide would be a very good way of de-risking these drugs long term. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Do you think that um, part of teriflunamide mm -hmm. success um, can be attributed to its antiviral effect or would that need to be tested further? That'll need to be tested further, yeah. The company doesn't want to invest in that, Kimberly. We've asked them to do trials, but because the patent's about to expire or reasonably soon, you know, any investment in teriflunamide, um, have, you know, they would like to see a return and they're not going to see a return. So we we, we try to get them to do yeah, a trial of antivirals mm. and uh, they've said no. So I need to um, so Ben, you're working in general medicine now, or will be, um, when you, so yeah. as you know, teriflunamide is a, a, a <laughs> leflunamide, which is licensed for rheumatology, <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, is the pro drug and gets converted to teriflunamide, uh, and so the equivalent dose is 2014. So 20 milligrams of leflunamide is the same as 14 milligrams mm -hmm. of teriflunamide, which is the licensed dose. And leflunamide has been shown to be pretty good antiviral, and they actually use it in, in certain countries to treat BK virus uh, nephropathy, mm -hmm. which 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 typically happens in transplant patients that are, are immunocompromised. And uh, leflunamide stops them shedding BK virus and is, is pretty effective in uh, stopping viral replication. So there's no doubt teriflunamide has an antiviral response. You know, um, and that may be some of its mode of action. Who knows? Who knows? Interesting. Okay. It'll be, it'll be so nice to get transcriptomic data from the, I wonder if they've got transcriptomic data in this trial. It'd be lovely to know what's happened to the transcriptomic data. Yeah. Well, they've stored everything, right? Yeah, they have stored everything. I wonder if they'll give yeah. it us the data. You know you the the da uh, ben, you want the data? You would. You'd want the data, oh. wouldn't you? I want the data. I want the data. Yeah, they won't get. They won't give it to us. They. Why would they? Why would they release it? What's What's in it for them? Unless they're compelled to. Um, no, if you can give them a good hypothesis, they may release it. I, I'll find out. I'll ask. Uh, I'll ask D if they've got transcriptomic data. It'd be interesting, but the if problem, you do discover some some mechanism of how their drug works, and then other people can mimic that or come up with biosimilars, that's that's not in their 
pecuniary interest, isn't it? No, no, it's not. It's not. That's the problem. You can do the work, but then they won't let you publish it. That's the problem. <laughs> Iman, you're very quiet in the background. Do you want to say anything about this trial? Yeah, I think she was in the register room, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not... Yeah, so I was just wondering, what about the secondary progressive MS? I mean, shouldn't that be compared to saponamide or something else, apart not to terfenamide? Yeah, so I mean, when this trial was started many years ago, uh, saponamide was only going into, it was in trial at the same time. So they wouldn't have converted it to trial to saponamide. But again, the, the secondary progressive patients in this trial is relapsing secondary progressive, so it's active MS. They haven't done a trial in people that have, have SPMS that aren't having relapses, which would be a much harder bar to pass. And I would agree they should do that trial. You know, mm -hmm. it would be quite nice mm -hmm. to know what happens to people with more advanced MS, but they're not doing it. And another question, so this would be as equivalent to oculizumab, so is it like high efficacy DMT? Yes. So why, why, so terfenamide is not high efficacy DMT, right? So it's a first line platform therapy? Yes. So how does they mm -hmm. compare like high efficacy to first line? But it's, it's a similar, it's similar to the, the oratorio trial in, with oculizumab. So oculizumab was compared to interferon beta, and so did it, so now there is a new CD20 monoclonal antibody and they compare it to ter teriflunamide because teriflunamide and inter interferon beta have a sort of similar efficacy profile. And so the companies probably wanted to avoid that, um, that um, they wanted to avoid using interferon beta because then the results would be very, very comparable with oculizumab. And I think they, when designing this trial, they thought it was in their favor or in, in, in would be in their benefit to have a treatment that is not exactly the same as interferon beta, but is in the same ballpark as interferon beta, teriflunamide. So that's, I personally think, why this CD20 antibody was compared to teriflunamide and not to interferon beta and not to a higher efficacy drugs. Well, they wanted to give themselves a chance of beating it. That's why. You know, it's obvious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you design a trial to you design a trial to get a positive result. So if they put this drug against a uh, higher efficacy DMT, they would have been asking. It yeah, may have had some problems, you know. So, yeah, why would you do that? So, <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true. But true. I also think it's very good that we are now past the the uh, the phase where we where placebo was socially accepted to be integrated in yeah clinical trials. So, luckily, we're past that stage. Saying that, though, we we had, we were asked to participate in a teriflunamide me too. A, you know, follow on uh, teriflunamide. They wanted to do it against placebo, and I said, no, I said to, oh yeah. Oh, really? I, I said to the um, CRO that was, I said, there's just no way we're going to be able to recruit patients to a teriflunamide type drug compared to placebo. It's just not going to be possible. No. Good luck, Ben. Ben, have you had COVID yet? Uh, I had it back when it was cool. Yeah, yeah. I've had, I've had the first jab as well. Okay, so you feel, com you feel quite comfortable you've got immunity. Well, I think so, but that might be cavalier and uh, ill-informed, but I feel psychologically protected, yeah. Right. Famous, famous last words. The ne neurology department is dropping like flies again. Who, who else has got it? Uh, Charlie from his super spreader infant, uh, Apexia. <laughs> They're all dropping. Oh, shit. As, it, as you can see from him, the, the registrar's office is tiny, so it's a super spreading event, I think. So, I'm sitting in Ben Turner's office, so I'm not worried. <laughs> so, so, so Ben, tell me, it, um, the, the, did a picture and Charlie get it despite being vaccinated? Yeah, I, I can't remember when Charlie was vaccinated, but uh, a picture had the vaccine New Year's Eve, first, uh, sorry, Christmas Eve, on the first one. Uh, 